to approve the agenda. Second. Motion by Josh, second by Amanda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Agenda is adopted. We have a presentation. Lori here? Yep. Oh, there you go. Lori Nelson started with the CCEC, which is the Community and Civic Events Committee, in May of 2018. It was a representative of the Boy Scouts of America, Troop 325. Lori has been a great contributor to the CCEC since she, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, since her start by adding fresh ideas to the activities to each event. She has been responsible for always arranging the Boy Scouts to help volunteer for the egg hunt, fire rescue days, Halloween, and tree lighting. Lori has volunteered numerous hours of, uh, for each of these events herself. The city of Elkanoo Market recognizes and thanks Lori for dedicated and valuable service to the citizens of the city. We're gonna miss you. Yes. Thank you very much. Oh, you have to get your picture taken. Oh, I have to get my picture taken. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone here to speak under public comment? No. Okay. We'll close public comment. Is there anything on consent agenda anyone has questions on or would like pulled? Motion to approve consent agenda. Second. Motion by Josh, second by Amanda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Consent passes. Okay. We have no public hearings, so general business. We have one item, the water supply plan update. I'm going to share a presentation um, that Rich is going to do. We'll just um, look at the first two slides. I, I did get submitted questions, um, so I prepared, prepared a response to those. That does not mean I wouldn't respond to other questions that come up uh, during this discussion. And I just wanted to uh, touch on uh, what I called the preamble for you to keep in mind as you uh, enter into discussion about the water supply plan. If you want to bring up the next slide, please. So these responses that I'm recommending in the water supply plan are based on no, uh, known information or information that can be reasonably anticipated to occur or not occur, and that it, based on conclusions from professional studies, submitted applications or council decisions currently under consideration. My intention was to avoid any supposition or guessing unless it's required to respond directly to the template. So population projections, future water demand, you could call it a guess. It's our you know, best guess based on data, but uh, it's a future thing that can't be really known. Um, however, that doesn't mean that we can't revise the plan as new information becomes available, or that new information won't be gathered as part of required or opportune studies. For example, a, a pump test or whatever may yield information that makes us want to make changes later, either way. And uh, the water supply plan, keep in mind, will be revisited again and again, uh, at least every 10 years, but also probably with any significant changes in your water use or uh, infrastructure. Uh, sometimes updates are required for that, and the council can always choose to update even annually. I know some cities do that. So those are um, kind of my starting point. Um, you noticed a lengthy memo in your packets explaining each table and each narrative. Um, we decided to prepare that given the amount of interest that was um, being seen in the supply plan. 
and I also decided that I would dig in personally and make those responses, so uh, that's why I'm here to answer the questions and we didn't bring in subject matter experts. Uh, the idea is that if I can't interpret what they've told us and convey it to you in the plan, then more work is probably needed. So I'll take uh, any questions you care to send my way at this point. Council, anyone have any questions? We've reviewed this quite a quite a lot, and we've made some changes. But and then I don't know. Were you going to go through any of the submitted questions, or my intention was to let you ask them, okay, and, and then respond no, no, one no, by yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, does that work for you? Go ahead. Yes. Okay, and, and and I'll preface all of this by uh, or first state just you know how appreciative I am of you and, and the team for going through this and continuing to you know, put up with or, or go through these questions and, and make the, the recommended changes or just at least have a discussion. So um, I've appreciated that process and um, because I am probably one of the dumbest ones in this room um, about some of this stuff. So, um, so thank you. I just wanted to say that right off the bat. Um, so specifically in these questions I sent over to uh, Tom and Rich, uh, earlier, um, page 13, table six. This one talks about uh, having not having uh, dedicated emergency power sources uh, as backups. Should we consider that, you know, like we do for whatever we have the generators for, pumping the water out? I mean, should we consider something like this or start to build into our capital outlay or some planning piece? Yeah. Next slide, please. The uh, answer uh, in the water supply plan is correct. It is no to uh, Elko's well two and three do not have. But the answer to your question is yes, and we are recommending that we add generation when we bring forward the proposed 2024 well as we move further through this process. Our plan was to include generation at at least one of the existing Elko wells. Uh, if you'd like more, I have a longer answer, or if you're satisfied <laughs> with that, we can uh, move on to the next no, question. Sounds like we're on the same page, uh, at least to consider it. Uh, so the next one was on page 14 of the water supply plan. Uh, this was in regards to New Market Well 3. You know, should we consider, uh, regardless of kind of the reactive nature of how the plan lays it out, of being able to turn it on, and it sounds like with the recent update too, it'll only take a day or two to actually prep it and get it ready. Is that something like we would want to consider doing even more proactively to have it on the ready and, and do that day or two of work now? Um, and if we did, or part of that consideration, would that be to offset some of the costs to adding new wells in the future? Is it cheaper to do that versus some other thing? Uh, advance two slides, please. Uh, so the question is, do we make emergency well New Market 3 ready in advance of ever needing it? And the answer is no. Uh, the setup that would be needed involves putting in some chlorine and fluoride tanks uh, for storage, getting the chemicals in there, adding feed pumps. That doesn't take long to do, but once they're there, if they're not used, they kind of turn to crud. So you need to use them and maintain them, and we just don't think it's worth doing that up front and trying to, for a well that has a very low probability of being needed, it'll get lower if we add a well next year uh, for the uh, firm's capacity, uh, that's not part of the agenda, but that's in the CIP. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also, uh, we don't want to, uh, unless we absolutely have to, introduce untreated water into the system. And so that a little bit relates to the last part of your question, which actually wasn't in, so I don't, but I do have a, a response. So we can't just use this water. We would have to pipe it to the water treatment plant to treat it the cost to pipe it from where it is to the plant is probably equal to or greater than a new well, but the bigger problem is where do you run the pipe? We don't have the right of way. If we acquire the right of way, where do we acquire it so that it's not gonna be an obstacle to future development? Uh, so it, it, it's possible, but it's something we uh, aren't positioned to do right now. We do have a backup plan that as development occurs, we would extend raw water piping where it makes sense so that we can gradually bring a connection from that well to the plant, 
but who knows how long that could take. But that's what makes sense to us right now. So that's your answer. Okay. Got a couple more. Go ahead. Uh, page 23, table 10. Um, so this is one where we unchecked it. Um, we unchecked several boxes of you know possible risk to the river stream, trout stream, um, based on, and I, and I get why we unchecked it, I, it, based on the data we currently have uh, and the LRE report uh, suggests that, you know, there isn't a risk to these certain things. You know, my brain says we're going to be doing the, um, the required testing and, and pump testing, and that may say otherwise. Um, so I guess the question would be, and maybe it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, of do we uncheck it now and do the pump testing and see that there may be a risk uh, to it and then have to go back in and recheck it and put mitigation measures and stuff in there? Or do we leave it checked as it was in a previous version and then do the pump testing and see that, no, okay, it, it, there isn't a, a risk. It doesn't appear based on the testing that was done and go in and update it and uncheck it. Is there a recommendation or preference either way? I can explain why I recommended unchecking it mm -hmm. with some background information, uh, but at the end of the answer, it will still be, it's a little bit six and one half a dozen of the other. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. So boxes are recommended to be checked only if the city feels there's a reasonable potential for impact based on what we know to be true right now. We find no reason to expect rivers, streams, lakes, or wetlands within five miles of the wells that would be affected by pumping in Elk New Market. Uh, I can explain more. No, but but in so a couple pieces in there jump out at me. There's the reasonable potential, so that's where I could, you know, maybe lean towards the let's keep a check because there's a reasonable potential in my brain that it could impact it. Now that's probably varying degrees of opinion. I'm not an expert, so. Uh, but then that five miles. I mean that that's in a variety of different sections of this. I mean so, maybe there. That I, comes. Um, but that is a very set thing that this is what we should be focusing our water supply plan on is the five mile piece yeah I mean that's a little bit arbitrary but there's some background to it mm -hmm. so for one thing right in the DNR's table under trout streams five miles is one of the criteria that they offer that cities might use to decide whether or not there's a risk mm -hmm. but it also happens to be about the distance that's actually a little further uh, if you go to the next slide and I know you've seen this before, it's confusing and boring, uh, but it does tell the story pretty well, uh, if you bear with me. I was actually starting to understand this as I stared at it. Yes. I'm starting to get it. So if we start at the top and work down, you see a jagged black line. That represents, although in a very distorted way, the ground surface from um, roughly the Elko Newmarket area where I've highlighted the three Elko Newmarket production wells in blue. Uh, the, the wells are represented by a straight up and down black line that goes from the surface down to what looks like blue bricks and further down looks to what looks like um, sandstone, which is, is what it is, down to the bottom of the Jordan and Prairie du Chien aquifer system. Uh, and that ground surface follows generally um, Roughly, the Vermilion River watershed, or water, or, I'm sorry, the Vermilion River down to uh, the Lakeville area where the ground starts to go back up again. So you can see the ground, we're quite a bit higher in Elk New Market. If you look at the numbers on the left, they're hard to read, but we're in that 1140, 1160 range um, versus over where the uh, watershed is at its lowest, uh, at least on this graph, in the roughly the 900 if I'm reading that right, 960 elevation range. So that's the ground surface. Uh, I'll ignore for now there's some yellower stuff and the white stuff is, is the ground that's underneath us that our buildings and roads are built on, uh, which is basically a very thick layer of what they call till on the map, but it's a clay-like, um, very non-porous uh, material. Uh, the yellow stuff further to the east uh, is more sand and gravel. Um, then below that thick white layer, uh, there's the blue bricks and the yellow sandstone. That represents the surface of the aquifer that uh, we all tap into for our water supply in this area. 
The aquifer, as you might recall, is what they call a confined aquifer. That means more water wants to be in the blue and yellow than can fit. And so it goes, it, it's under pressure. And if you poke a hole in it, water will rise to roughly that dark blue line that runs horizontally across the middle of the graph. So when we dig a well in Elko Newmarket, for example, we have to drill through all the white layer down into the blue. Uh, now, because we have larger production wells, we go all the way through. But once you hit that um, blue layer with enough water will rise in your pipe up to about that blue line. That's, that's the water table, uh, the pressure head. So what's, uh, what's going on here is that the city and the lakes and wetlands and rivers right around us within about a five mile radius are well above that blue line. So even if our, sand, our soil wasn't clay, it was sand, and water could move freely through it, all our rivers and lakes would drain down to the aquifer rather than the aquifer draining up into us. That water uh, has no way to get up there other than being pumped. Um, so we've got gravity uh, on the side of not uh, having our wells interfere with surface waters, but we also have that very thick layer of clay so would our response would would the response to this then be different if we were drilling all Absolutely. In this area? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. How far away is it? I mean, could you put that in perspective? So I've got a green dimension that runs horizontally that says 5.2 miles. That's roughly to the point from Elko Newmarket's well 4 to where the ground surface and the water table approximately intersect. I mean, it's so it's the, you don't the blue pinpoint line that is about exactly. Five miles? It's a little over five, five it's 5.2 miles um, scaled on a map as the crow flies, which is, of course, how the water is going to travel uh, underground. So, yes, if we were in a different position, either lower elevation or, or uh, especially where the water table and the ground surface intersect, we'd be, I'd be much more concerned about potential impact. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not hydraulically disconnected. They could be. We can't know that for sure, and pump testing will attempt to uh, address that, but based on just the, the geolo geology and the geography that we see here, we think it's unlikely that our pumping would impact anything on the surface in this area, and so that's why I'm recommending not checking it, and that's based on LRE's uh, report. So would uh, so that's fan. I mean that helps. Thank you. Uh, and I and go ahead. Oh, okay, shutting up. Uh, but so the pump testing you said will test to see, or as we do, as the test is designed by whomever it's designed by, will test for any of that hydrologically connectedness or lack thereof. To the extent possible, I mean, you can't test everything, but you try to find representative locations wells, for example, that are in a shallow surface aquifer, or even driving um, some sort of a small well near the river, uh, drive it down to where it's wet and put a gauge on that and monitor it during the pump test to see if there's any fluctuation that would indicate a connection between your pumping and the hydrostatic pressure at that location. So yeah, I would, I would venture there will be some effort to check that out. Mm -hmm. Not that every pocket is connected, but you you know you, you look for what you can that's reasonably close. So not in an effort to screw up your slide deck, but I'm going to skip one question and go to the next one because oh, I geez. think it's kind of <laughs> kind of connected. It, it was uh, page 38, table 22. So and it's where we unchecked the surface water level flow or water flows. And, yep. And saying that there may not be a potential risk. My same comments applied. It's should we wait until we get the testing and adjust either way or whatever? And my response was going to be to refer you back to this section because the phenomenon is the same. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and you said it kind of in the beginning piece uh, that uh, we can update pieces as new information is gathered. Absolutely. You know, we'll gathered yep. through the pump test. Do we have to go through the same process of updating the water supply plan, i.e., all the 15 steps or 12 steps or whatever it is to update it, or can we if more you quickly want it, update? If you want it to be the official water supply plan that's recognized by Met Council and the DNR, yes. 
if you want it to be your version that you're using for planning and decision making guidance, you could just make that submittal less frequently, you know, mm -hmm. when you're required to or when there's enough change that you want to go through that process. Okay. Um, maybe next slide. I, I think I had some. Um, well, I was going to go on, and, and since we appear to have time and an audience, perhaps I just will jump in. Uh, so I was going to um, just walk through a thought exercise. Suppose we checked Lake as a resource type that was at risk because we're worried about it or what. That leads to, okay, what resource name? I mean, there are small water bodies or rivers or lakes. You, you might check the or say Vermilion or whatever. Then you move into what's the risk? Um, you're obviously not going to check none anticipated if you checked it as being a resource that might be at risk. Uh, so what risk are you looking for? Is it flow and water level decline? Possibly. That's probably the most likely candidate if you were going to go through this exercise. Then you get into how did you assess that risk? And the asterisk at the top means that you are to attach your documentation for assessing that risk to your water supply plan in the appendix. Uh, so that starts to be a problem if you're just doing it on a, well, let's cover our basis, you know, but we don't really have any good evidence. Um, it kind of leaves a hole in the plan. It gets worse as you move to the right. What's your protection or threshold goal? Well, obviously you don't know, so you check additional data as needed to establish. Now you've committed yourself to further study. Mitigation measures or management plan, there's really only two that would apply, and neither one of them are probably in the city's interest without good data to back it up, and that's changing your groundwater pumping, which means less groundwater pumping, or or moving your wells to another location, which is a pretty costly thing to do unless you really have data to back up the need for that, or increasing conservation, which of course we should be doing anyway, so you could check that box, but it not, might not be. You know. It just, it, it kind of takes you down a hallway with some dead ends that you can't answer right now. So my thought process through this was let's stick with what we know. As we know more, we make changes and respond that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I won't even talk about the last column, which is monitoring something that y you don't even know how, you know, what the problem is. So um, we could go to the next slide. Anticipating your next question. I don't have anything. The there, next question, uh, <laughs> page 25, table 10, was mitigation measure and management plan. So one of the, and I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but the, it was listed as lower pumps and affected wells at city cost. I mean, in, in, in the column over, I believe it said avoid impacting wells or uh, avoid well interference, blah, blah, blah. Yep. I mean, so the mitigation measure to me felt like it wasn't a mitigation. It was a reaction. It was a, here's the step you take once you once this happens. Um, and this, I mean, throughout this whole entire process, this is my biggest concern is the well interference piece. Yep. Um, so it's so just... It didn't sit right, like that's not really a mitigation I, proactive I, thing. I'll, I'll be happy to try and explain. Yeah. So just a little background, this box uh, relates to um, well interference, which was checked uh, in Table 10 as a possible risk. And of course the concern is, just like Josh said, we increase our pumping drawdown as such that it begins to affect the viability of neighboring wells where they're starting to pull in air and not getting the water supply they expect. Um, so to me, mitigation means measures taken to reduce or address a problem, not uh, avoid it. Mm -hmm. And it's probably your most viable option given that you have on the order of a million dollar investment in the well that you're currently using and you want to continue to use. Um, the probably the the least costly and most effective option if interference is discovered during pump testing would be to if possible and it usually is just lower that individual's well pump in the casing because the casing we know has to at least go down to the aquifer the well pump usually sits well above that because it only needs to be in the water in the well casing to get water because the water rises to it because of pressure in the aquifer. Um, so if we draw it down to where they're not quite in the water deep enough, 
you have a well driller come, you add some uh, pipe segments, they can add that in, put that well down further so it's in the water deeper so when your drawdown uh, happens, they're still below that water and they'll get, get water. Um, it's not cheap, but it's much less costly, of course, depending on the magnitude and how many, uh, than drilling a new well somewhere else for you or for them. Uh, the other option you have is to not pump as much. And that comes from either limiting usage by your residents or businesses or limiting growth or installing a new well that's further away from those impacted wells, which is not always easy either. I mean, it's costly, but then finding the land and the location, bringing the water, raw water back to the treatment plant. So there are no good options, so lowering someone's pump is usually the best, and it's commonly done. And how much, I mean, estimated in today's value on May 25th, 2023, would you guess that it would cost to drop a well or drop whatever you just said? As long as nobody's writing this I, right, down. All right, Linda, I know it'll change tomorrow. Linda, we'll, write down 50000 but I think it's under ten. <laughs> okay. And and obviously, you know, the pump testing would give us a, a indica possible or would give us an indication of how many might be of impacted through this so process. So the pump testing, um, among other things, two real key things it's going to give us is, yes, when we're pumping at those rates for an extended period of time, does someone's well stop working? Mm -hmm. I mean, that'll, that'll show up. But it also, because we monitor various points at varying distances from the wells, allows us to confirm and calibrate the model that's used to calculate that drawdown curve. Because now we have known points, we can adjust the assumptions till that curve fits and apply it to other wells that might not have been monitored but are in that in that uh, zone of depression that, that is, results from those pumping rates. So then you'll get a pretty good idea what to expect at varying distances from the new, the, the pumping well. So it's data, but it's also possible uh, conflicts. So is everybody that can potentially be affected during time frames made aware of all this, like the pumping, a pump that's been planned? The, um, it's not always practical to notify everybody. It's surprising how many wells you don't barely know are there or if their home is occupied or it's an abandoned farmstead. But but yes, we are already, Renee's been working to identify different wells that we might use both to either monitor for impacts during the pump test or possibly even to use as a shallow well that might be in one of those sand and gravel aquifers near the surface to check that. Uh, whether the um, aquifers are interconnected, uh, but also to um, potentially reach out and advise them. But uh, I'm sure we'll also do other means to, of outreach on Facebook and, and so forth to, to publicize this, this is going on. Um, but we, um, well, we're going to probably end up with a range that goes quite a distance. We don't expect impacts um, really even, I mean, the closest wells are a third of a mile away. Uh, there may be no noticeable impacts at those wells because their pump is low enough that the drawdown is still above uh, where they are. My last question, page 43, table 26. Would we be open to, or maybe there's a rationale why first before I say that, um, but my, my brain went to um, deleting for non-significant user, and this is in relation to the tiered, block rates or the block rates increasing. Yep. So if we would be open to keeping keeping the language that's in there but delete the for non-significant user. Next slide, please. So that we have the flexibility in the future because we talked about we didn't want to be put in a box uh, or yep. put future councils in a box. So this particular table is um, listing all the city's methods it plans to use for reducing non-residential demand. So this is commercial, industrial, institutional, um, firefighting, stuff like stuff that's not single family or, or apartments. The last row in that table is where you are to list other plans that aren't listed above in the table that are just check boxes. So it describes existing plans not included and note existing plans, things we're already doing 
uh, given the assumption that I'm counting things that are already on your docket. For example, the significant user ordinance and agreements. I consider that we're assuming they're likely to be adopted mm -hmm. um, because it's already been uh, discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we currently discourage excess use for non-residence uses in addition to the other things, not on this, but in the table in the plan by using an increasing block rate structure for pricing for users that use less than 10,000 gallons per day or 1 million gallons per year, so non-significant users. They're treated the same as residential customers. They pay their base fee, they get up to 10,000 gallons at tier one for that base fee plus, and then they're charged usage for that first 10,000 gallons at the lowest rate. If they go above that, then the, that tier goes up and so forth, so just like a single family home. However, uh, it is different for significant users and actually more stringent because they're limited to whatever's in their significant user agreement and if they go above those limits, they're charged an excess use rate right off the bat. Whereas you recall earlier discussions where if they could use a multiple of their base rates, it would be way, way more water at the cheapest rate than the uh, approach we're recommending. So that's why that distinction is there, just to make it clear between non-significant users, they're basically like everybody else in town, and significant users. We wanted to capture both and, and try and make it clear. So if that helps understand why it's listed that way. Yeah, and I guess my, my intent of the question or the comment or the suggestion was just to be able to not put us in a box uh, or somebody else in a box in the future and so have to go through this change or this exercise first. Because we could do everything that you ju we just said, you just said hypothetically with the significant user agreement that's all in place, whether or not yep. we have those four words in there or not. Yep. And we could remove it and still then have it be an option in the future. Yeah. This is a plan for guiding decisions and forming people generally where you're tenting, but it doesn't limit you. If you decide to go a different direction next week, um, you have that freedom. Uh, and the city attorney could, could weigh in if you, if you like, but, um, and you can always change this. We're, we're just trying to report mm -hmm. to those interested what you're doing now or can reasonably anticipate it you intend to do based on what's been already discussed and put forward. Good. Those were my questions, suggestions, comments. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Amanda? I, I don't either. If anybody else agrees with me, otherwise the other ones, like I feel comfortable going either way. I mean, I assuming we can make the changes, I, I still think this plan is better than the current one we have in place anyway, so I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, and I know we don't need to boil the ocean and uh, good thing. Uh, we, we can come back and we can, uh, we can fix it, or tweak it based on the aquifer pump testing as well. Sure. Well, so maybe, uh, do you have the water supply plan handy? It's on page 43. Yeah. 43 right? Page 43, table 26. I mean, unless you think it would be harmful or uh, have a negative impact on how nope, we would. No, nope. I just picked a philosophy for, from yeah. the get-go and stuck yeah. with it yeah. um, rather than try and guess what you might or try and create new things for you to think about. Here's what we have. This is based on what we know. and. And that's what we went with. Rich, did you want me to share it for any reason or bring it up? It sounds okay. like there's some interest, so maybe. Okay. Unless you found it. I got it. Yeah. I mean, so I would just, it, it, if I had my way, which is all about me right now, rate tiers with increasing block pricing category? No, with block pricing comma, excess use rate for significant user category would still stand or something. And I mean, keep just remove that piece uh, of differentiating the non-significant because they're still going to have based on their 10,001 gallons per day or a million one per year, they're still going to have to have that significant user agreement and everything anyway. Yeah. 
If they're a smidge over, yes. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that they wouldn't be, you know, you'd, there's flexibility in how you set that max rate. It might be based on a multiple of their base rates in that case. Um, but without having an actual applicant. Yeah. And maybe it's as simple as, I mean, I, nothing in here is make or break anything. I still think it's better. I, I think we're moving in the right direction. I think we'll get more information as we do the pump testing and get more information. Scroll down a little bit, Renee. Um, so I think it's on page 43 at the top. Yeah, top of page 43. Yeah, this is page right 43. So what I'm meaning to say is that we use a rising block rate tier program mm -hmm. for all of our users except significant users, and they're subject to an excess use rate. I mean, even the way you just said that right now clicks in my I mean, that's what we currently do. So that's describing the situation yep. as of this moment. Yep. Unless we wanted to tweak the significant user ordinance agreement piece and add something in there, then we would want to reflect that in here. But we haven't had that conversation yet right. necessarily. Yep. Well, we haven't. So I mean, so then, and that'll be potentially coming back at a future council meeting here soon to yep. talk through yep. that. Um, so you, you're, what are you wanting? Are you wanting to see the language change? Are you? I just want to see if anybody else jumped all over and said, "Yeah, that's a great idea." Or if no, I mean, I don't really care. Um, I mean, uh, honestly, I kind of looked at it as a little bit of, I hate to use the term wordsmithing, but yeah. I mean, there was nothing that was presented that I thought was unreasonable. Mm -hmm. but, but and I'd rather, rather wordsmith. I'd rather wordsmith and, and get right the significant user agreement and ordinance. Right. If we're gonna nail down anything because that's where the enforcement and the teeth and the, the teeth actual are. yep is so and if we want to tweak this after we have that conversation we can tweak it after we have that conversation too absolutely so we should probably do this by motion if we're going to move forward with it right that's correct okay. i'll make a motion to adopt the water supply plan second motion by myself second by amanda all in favor Aye. All opposed? Aye. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Water supply plan, plan passes. Uh, we're missing Tom, but is there anything from administration to pass on? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, so nothing from Public Works. Police? Any questions? Engineering. Uh, Tom asked me to give you an update on the uh, water appropriation permit um, since he couldn't be here. And these are largely his conversations, but I'm aware of what's been going on. So, um, and you may be aware of some of it, but for those interested, um, the DNR has determined that an aquifer test will be required. Uh, they have assigned a person to that task. However, they've also told us that due to their workload and backlog, it could be several months before we even see a plan for the test. And once that's you know, adopted and agreed to by everybody, it could be several more months before the test is performed and any analysis and reporting findings are done. So um, we uh, conferred with uh, LRE, who is our sub-consultant for hydrogeology, Dave Hume, you've all met him, and uh, he informed us that it is not uncommon for cities to prepare their own test pump plan with the help of uh, professionals, that that plan uh, can be submitted to the DNR for review, and when they approve it, that becomes the plan. Um, we have conferred with the DNR. They um, uh, agreed with that, uh, that it's happened before. They are comfortable with the city of Elka Newmarket using that approach given um, their own backlog, of course, but also the reputation of LRE as a you know pretty recognized firm in that area. And staff has been directed to work with LRE to prepare maps of wells and uh, pumping um, 
information from Corey and how where are we going to go with the water and and that type of thing. So we've been uh, already working on putting together a test pump plan that will be led uh, by LRE and uh, would expect to start seeing drafts coming to staff in the next week or so and then uh, being submitted to the DNR for review. This is purely just the plan for the test itself. No this analysis or anything is coming from LRE. It's all, that's all DNR, correct? Um, it could go beyond that. I mean, they have certainly allowed cities to run their own tests. DNR can choose to monitor, visit, whatever, um, but also to take the data, perform the analysis, write a report, but every step of the way has to be submitted to the DNR for review and they approve it um, back and forth with comments. And that happens either way, whether they prepare it and we review it or we prepare it and they review it, it's, it's a, a back and forth, a mutual thing. So it could, it could go beyond that, but all we've been directed to do at this point is prepare a test pumping plan and obviously anything more than that would come back to council. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. Well, and I just wanted to point out, so I started digging a little bit too. I mean, right on the DNR's water use permit website in aquifer pumping tests, I mean, it specifically says that permit applicants also have the option of hiring a qualified licensed professional geologist to prepare specifications, which the DNR can then review. So it sounds like that's exactly this. It, yep. Yep. Um, and that the DNR does not do the testing. Um, ever, they don't have the manpower. The, the they don't they don't do the the DNR cannot conduct the test for you. Yep. They can provide some assistance with measuring water levels as staff time allows, and then they'll do the data analysis and and interpretation of that da data, and then the review and whatever. But they the DNR itself does not do the testing, and I learned that. As yep. Well as yep. Kinda, yep. Yeah, no, it would, be, it would be Corey and company supported by consultants with data logging equipment to set up to make sure it's all recorded automatically and logged so that it can be downloaded to, to analyze. Um, but there's a lot of background work Renee can tell you already, just finding these wells. Who owns them? How deep are they? Um, we'd be doing that for the DNR just as well as we would for LRE, so it's, it's not as separated as it might seem at first glance. What, and have we gotten any clarification on, uh, and, and I know Tom has shared like the potential cost for this testing, um, you know, reading this too, again, r further up in this DNR website, it says uh, there's approximately 400 groundwater permit applications each year and typically only two to six aquifer tests are ever required. I added the ever, uh, are required each year. Um, AKA the DNR never requires aquifer tests. Um, well, and that's where you may have heard early on that we anticipated a 60 to 90 day review of our appropriation permit because it is not common. I mean, it's not unheard of, but usually you don't. 99% of the time they don't. They don't. Yeah. Um, but with that said, you know, have we gotten any feedback of why uh, the DNR is requiring the aquifer test? Not that I disagree, because I want to make sure we don't have any well interference issues. Um, as it's my biggest issue or question, but do we know why? Is it because of the, a potential user? Have they, in, in their letter, or I would assume it's a formal thing that says, hey, Alta New Market, water permit applicant, you must do aquifer testing because of blah, blah, blah. Is it because of the water amount? Is it because of a usage? Have, did they specify anything? I can only put myself in their shoes and imagine because I don't know the answer directly. So they directly. didn't give I, us a they letter. Did not not that I am aware of. No. no, there's been no paper letter. There's been a couple of emails, um, but I don't know that there that has been identified. I would guess it has more to do with the magnitude and change of, of water, not the end users or where it's going. And possibly also that maybe geographically they don't have as much data in this area as they'd like, and this is an opportunity to get more. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I don't disagree with it, and that's fine, but I disagree with the fact that we're being treated differently, and if we're being treated differently because of a, and if it's because we're going to go up in the amount, that's yeah. one thing. If I we mean, were just looking to grow and we expected to grow, you know, and we needed our water appropriation permit to go up, yeah. Fine, that's on city to pay for it. If it's not, though, and if it's because of a potential user, yeah. I would expect the user and or the developer to pay for this, not me, taxpayers, and the city to pay for it. And that's what I would just, I'm curious about of 
It just it rubs me wrong. Yeah, I don't have a direct answer. We are almost tripling our appropriation permit request from 125 to 365. Uh, that seems to me like the kind of the obvious, but I, I don't know that for sure. And we I, could try to find out if that's something. I would love for us to find out because I would love to not pay for that. That's a police officer in our budget that is 5%. That is um, money that we just aren't rolling in like other cities might be rolling in that never get to uh, have this test when they're increasing by hundreds of millions every year, billions for crying out loud. Yeah. And they don't ever have to do these tests. So Tom has now become our lead contact with the DNR. I hate to shake that up. Mm -hmm. And given what he's going through, it might be a while for this to come through. But we'll make sure that we attempt to get a response on that. Anything else on the engineering? No. Community development. So just before we move on, just so we're clear, so LRE, we are we are moving forward for them to do the prep of the test, and that is it at this point. It's basically a plan, specifications, pump here's at this rate, this DNR, location. Here's what we're going to be because we're going to do the test anyway. The yep. not going to do the test. So here's the test that we're going to do. Tell us that it meets the specifications of whatever you think we need to do it for. Yeah. Um, and and then will that. What's I mean, the timing of that? Will that get brought back? Will that then we'll be able to see that? And well, one of the reasons that this caught our interest is because we're pretty confident we can turn around a test plan much quicker than two or three months. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more like two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but how long it will take them to review and approve it, we have no idea. No, I, mean, I was looking more for that first part, like how long it would take to get the yeah, test. Yeah, I'm plan expecting plan. to uh, review it. And I've been talking with Dave daily. I expect to have a draft that he and I can look over in the next few days. We'll bring staff in to go through it with them, uh, hopefully next week. And once everybody's on board, the idea would be to submit it for review by the DNR. Mm -hmm. And and I just saying it again, and I heard you say it, and I repeated it, but it will test the, the, the hydrologically connectedness or lack thereof to the best extent possible, so we make sure that that is a piece of this test. I talked with Dave about that when I called him to get permission to use his materials for my uh, slides, uh, and we were talking about trying to find some shallow well aquifers in the area that we might be able to monitor, uh, and if we can't, possibly drilling some um, shallow sand points near the river <coughs> to monitor hydrostatic pressure impacts there. So yes. All right, sir. Community development. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, can yeah. I say something here? Well, we're going to be done in just a moment, and you're welcome to speak to any of us. Thank you. Uh, anything for? No report. No. Anything for parks? I know draft minutes were in the packet. I'm assuming nothing was passed on. Uh, um. CCEC. We met last week finalizing fire rescue days. Have some new stuff for in the park. Fire rescue day is June 24th, so, well, the weekend of June 24th. All right. Um, can I go back and just give a quick yeah, update on parks? Ahead. You guys probably have heard this off the record, but there was a, um open house up at Woodcrest park to get resident input regarding uh, possible redevelopment of the park and it was well attended and really fun to see all the kids and kids and parents giving suggestions so. nice. uh, I don't have a scale report I wasn't able to make the last scale meeting um, without Tom there's no service delivery report is there an I-35 report no, I gave no. it last time I think the next two months are canceled or well, yeah. I'll check. Any discussion by council? Motions to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Amanda. I'll second the motion. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 All right, meeting's adjourned. <laughs>